Thank you, Alison, for doing this. Thank you for uh, agreeing to do this. And all the way from Hong Kong, uh, 12 hours away, uh, ahead of me. So maybe you can tell me a little bit about the future because you're already <laughs> there. Um, I really appreciate uh, you doing this. And uh, especially, of course, with your experience of being a few weeks ahead of, of the curve in terms of what this virus does. But firstly, um, you know, not many people or many people who, are, who might be watching this might not know you. So would you tell us a little bit about you know, your role and what you're doing in Hong Kong, but also your journey there is really interesting. Thank you, sure. Um, so my name is Alison Friedman and I'm the Artistic Director of West Kowloon Cultural District. The West Kowloon Cultural District is one of the largest arts and cultural developments in the world right now. We are in the heart of Hong Kong on Victoria Harbor, building multiple performing arts centers, two museums and big, beautiful open outdoor park space. And in the last year and a half, we opened our first two performing arts centers, the Shichu Center, which is our opera house, our Chinese opera house, and Free Space, which is our center for contemporary performance. It's a big black box theater, one of the largest black box theaters in Hong Kong, with, of course, rehearsal studio, other space in the building as well. So I've been in Hong Kong working at West Kowloon for about two and a half years now. And before that, I was in Beijing for 16 years working in China. So I was actually in Beijing during SARS back in 20, 2003. I remember. Um, exactly, yeah. So also working in the arts the last six, uh, eight years of the 16, I was running my company I started called Ping Pong Productions that was a performing arts exchange nonprofit. Well, uh, it's, a, it's a great journey and uh, you're ending up, ended up in a fantastic place where I know you're doing great work and uh, uh, a very, very exciting time to be there, I'm sure. Uh, um, <laughs> but a unique perspective also on, compared to the American perspective, on, on this moment that we're in and this terrible virus that's just suspended life as we know it. So how has your work been affected? Uh, and you just told me that you're just about to go back to the office. Tell, me, tell us a little bit about that and, and, and how's the, the work that you're doing being Im impacted? Uh, by by the virus so far, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we shut down our venues. I'm, I mean, it's 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 been heartbreaking to open two major performing arts centers only to have to shut them back down and cancel months of performances. We uh, this came to kind of a, a, a started to rise in Hong Kong right around Chinese New Year. So it was the end of January, and here we are at the end of April. So it's been a quarter of a year already. Um, when it started, my own perspective at first was a, a little bit on the cynical side. I thought, okay, this is SARS PTSD. Everybody just doesn't want SARS to come back. So there's some overreactions. Why are we shutting down our venues? Why are we being that extreme? And now I've, I've of course come completely around the other side and just think absolutely we did the right thing. The Hong Kong government did the right thing. You have to do, be drastic because it's the only way to, to stop this. And here we are, we've had multiple days with zero cases in Hong Kong, and they just announced that everyone goes back, uh, the, the civil servants go back to work on Monday in Hong Kong. And so we're, we're not a government organization, we're a private, uh, not private NGO, but we follow government obviously, you know, for, for direction. So we are all um, going back in shifts on Monday. Now our venues are still shut, our performances are canceled through July now, and, and we're starting to get nervous about August, September, because both customer confidence, will people want to sit in a closed theater with you know, the notorious coffers, <laughs> people coughing in a theater, and, uh, and, and certainly for the international troops, I mean, what will touring look like in the future? These These... We're all having these conversations now about right. what is the future of our industry. Well, you know, uh, you're sort of two months ahead of the curve with us, and and uh, it's interesting to get that perspective. And so, if you're saying July, August, we are talking about sort of October, December. You know, we're yeah, uh, and we're learning from what we see from the east. And so, thank you for sharing that. But you know, artists are resilient, of course, uh, but that's not to say this is an easy time for artists. And I, I just wonder, 
I, I wouldn't say you've been through it and it's done, but you certainly yeah. have experienced it for longer than we have. What's the role that artists and art played during the four months? Um, I think that we're, everybody in every industry is re-examining our purpose and how, what we do and, and how we do it, but more fundamentally why. <laughs> and there's been a lot of reflection on why are we doing what we're doing other than just because we've always done it. Um, there's, there's an element of opportunity in that to, to really um, refocus and redefine on our core values and core missions. Um, at the beginning of all of this, you know, the conversations, um, I'm assuming a sympathetic audience will be watching this, other, other people in our industry. So we all of us believe at core that artists are crucial to society. Um, you know, they're, we're not considered essential workers by government policy. The theaters are not reopening for a while. Um, they are reopening libraries and uh, museums because you can have people at further distance and control who comes in and out at more time spaces. So to have a government, you know, and, and different policies tell you you're not essential workers, it, it, it hits that bruise of insecurity that I think we all feel that we're just decoration or we're, we're extra or um, somehow not of core essence to what is needed. And so a lot of what the conversations over these last four months have been are um, what is it that is essential about the creative drive? And I think I keep coming back to two elements. I think that um, the ability to create new things is a core human uh, impulse. And mm -hmm. Out of that creativity, obviously, comes cities, comes innovation, comes technology. But the arts is part of that because it's an expression of who we are as humanities, as humanity as a core, but humanities as these individual voices. And so we need it because it, it is both a reflection as well as a, a deeper dive into who we are. And so I don't think we'll see corona inspired art anytime soon nor do i want to see it because i think it's too early but i think the role that it's played in the last four months has been certainly a release and a relief um the people who have been bored at home are the lucky ones i think most people have been overwhelmed at home dealing with children homeschooling dealing with jobs dealing with a total disruption to normalcy. So I don't think art has been a distraction. I think the opportunity of all of these things that people have been putting online has been an opportunity for people to actually get more um, access and more, uh, um, I don't know, just connection to the, to the things that are out there. So um, I think that, yeah, I think, <sighs> I haven't answered your question. I think the short answer is it's, it's you're, you're asking the existential question of why art in a time of disaster. And um, partially maybe it's, maybe it's a, a, a circular answer, but because it's there, because we will do it anyways. Um, but also we need it to remind ourselves that we're human. Um, and it's that, that core kind of creative impulse will continue. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, it is a tough question that, that I think all of us are always thinking about. But as you say, we kind of have a, a sensitive spot about that sometimes in all kinds of debates. But right now, there's a really sharp focus on that. And I appreciate that answer. It's, uh, it, it, I think it does, it does speak to why art at all. Uh, yeah. It's so hard to talk to people in this incredibly challenging time and somehow prioritize art <laughs> it just feels yeah well i also i also think we'll need it more as we come out of this i mean yeah. maybe in the middle of it we need medical workers we need people getting ventilators cheaply and and mass available we need a cure we need a vaccine so i think we don't need everything all the time um so perhaps now maybe not art now is where we get quiet we go internal we rethink and then as we come out of this and as we start to heal that's when we need art because it's about it's about um, processing things that happen it's about reflection it's about 
um, it's, it's also about thinking of new possibilities. I mean, not all art is, but a lot of art is about the ability to imagine what can be. And, and coming out of this, we all need to imagine how the world can be because it's going to be very different. So I think we're actually going to need art much, much more as, as we start to come out of this than perhaps we do in the middle of it. Yes, I, I think that's right. And, uh, um, but it does remind me of a, a, a conversation I had about art during this. And, I, and I, I couldn't help wondering, can you imagine going through this and sitting at home in lockdown with no access to art? So you can't listen to music, you can't read a book, you can't look at a movie on TV or binge on Netflix. You, no right. art. Can you imagine this without the arts? people would lose their mind. <laughs> it was, yeah. Wow. It does make life a little bit more tolerable right now. Um, Absolutely. But yes. I okay. you know, that, there's an, there, that, there's, that there are other, other ways of being, other options, not just escapism, although that's, that I think is one purpose it can serve. Yeah. So our uh, uh, art here at the Arts Center is of course performing arts. And I know in your world, you do a lot more than just the performing arts, which is an interesting mix. Um, and so I want to ask you about performing arts specifically, uh, which is by essence an art of gathering physically and physically being together and breathing the same air, as you say, in the infamous coffers and, and of course, artists being really close together. What about the performing arts? How do we come out of this? Uh, uh, what might there be new ways to think about consuming and making it or what, what, what are your thoughts around that? It's, these are the exact conversations that we're having at West Kowloon, but also internationally with all of our colleagues about how the, the, one of the needs or one of um, the irreplaceable experiences of performing arts is about gathering in a place and time that can't happen again. And it's about, that collective shared experience. Um, and if moving forward, it looks like gathering and collect, collecting in crowds is going to be a challenge. Um, I wish I had the answers <laughs> of how we're going to do it differently. I think we're going to come back to live experience. I mean, I, I think all of the digital creation that's been happening in this interim is amazing. And it's something else. It's not a replacement for live uh, performance and that ex that experience of risk in the moment that it might someone might screw up, that a lamp might fall from the sky, that you know someone next to you might actually cough. Or one of my favorite experiences was in a performance of Wagner at the Kennedy Center in Washington D.C. An elderly gentleman fell asleep and he woke himself up by screaming, "Hello, Jessica!" in the middle of a very <laughs> quiet moment in, uh, in, in a thousand plus packed theater. I think perhaps art making might change uh, because the potential to rehearse digitally, the potential to create more privately um, might is possible. I, I wonder if we might be creating more works for smaller audiences for a while. Uh, if you look at, at the history of performance, we'd like to think it's all driven by the artist, but very often it's driven by external circumstances of resources, of the commissioners of great symphonies. And, um, and so perhaps in, in coming out of this, there will be a need for, for healing, for rejuvenation. So outdoor events, I think, will be the starting point, certainly for us. That's where we're thinking. At West Kowloon, we have beautiful outdoor space right on the harbor and in a congested city like Hong Kong, it's an oasis. And so as we build up customer confidence to return to theaters, we'll start perhaps in amphitheaters, we'll start outdoors, we'll start with outdoor music festivals, outdoor uh, art festivals. We have one in the works for this November, Knockwood. Um, our, our annual jazz fest last year had about 14,000 people over two days. And so that jazz fest will return uh, later this year. The, the other thing that's changing with the reality of potential travel restrictions for an indefinite period of time is, is a local focus. Um, and that's for two reasons. 
a local focus is practical because we won't be able to bring in international travel, but it's also needed to rebuild the local sector. Everybody has been hit so hard for months of no jobs, months of no performances, no work. I think yeah. there's a responsibility for art centers to really situate locally and, and support local artists and local, local, and I mean performing artists, but all kinds, and, and to um, help rebuild that and then slowly expand outwards. But there's a ca caveat there because I think one of the great things about performing arts is it does build bridges across countries and cultures. So if we get too focused locally, is there a risk we'll all get a bit um, myopic and, and lose that value that the performing arts has to show sides of countries and cultures that you don't see in the news and through commerce? It's so good to hear you talk about this and realize that the issues we're all struggling with are so universal. And today, we, we in a management meeting, we spoke exactly about this idea of this is a time to focus on local, but we also have to bring inspiration from elsewhere. You know, it's, it's the same story uh, just two months later. Uh, uh, I don't know if I ever told you this, but I knew Bing Tom very well. Um, oh. Wow. And, and worked with him in Calgary for uh, on a project. And uh, I, I saw the birth of your beautiful theater in his studio uh, in oh. Vancouver. Uh, and of oh. course, sad that he passed away, but I'm thinking about that beautiful theater and the great open space that he's got below the theater itself. That must be a, a gem right now. It is, uh, and, and you're talking about the Shichu Center, our Chinese opera house, which um, Bing Tom and Reverie Architects designed. And it's just this gorgeous work of architecture. It's already won all kinds of awards. And what he created, which at that time, you know, made our security team and our facilities maintenance team pull their hair out because it, the building doesn't close. Um, the, it's these gorgeous, sweeping, you know, five-story, uh, open air um, doorways, uh, kind of bringing back the idea of the town square and and openness of pagodas and the movement of air, the movement of chi through the space. So we in Hong Kong had this funny interim. We were we were shut down for about six weeks in January, February, March. We started to open up, and then when the cases swelled again, we we had a much sharper shutdown. And right there in the middle. We did two different performances in that atrium, trying to bring it back. So the we have uh, traditional Chinese music, free concerts before, and we'll bring it back again in in the atrium. And so we did two of those, and we had social distancing, so we actually had almost like velvet ropes barriers. Oh really? Um, we we chose to take the wind instruments out just because that's blowing. So we thought, okay, let's just do stringed and plucked instruments for the time being, just. So there's not the risk of blowing spit at this close distance for just an atrium performance. Um, and uh, yeah, and then of course, everyone had their masks um, in, the, in the, both in the audience and, and on, on in the performance in the middle of the atrium. So what are you telling artists right now? What do you, what do you have to say to them to either encourage them or help them or, or, or ask advice from them? What conversations are you having? With, with our artists, um, certainly from the beginning, and you know, our coronavirus came right at the tail end of, of eight months of social unrest with protests here in Hong Kong. And um, throughout all of those processes, and then certainly with the corona shutdown, we've been saying that we're certainly all in it together, and that's not empty words. Um, it's, it's all part of the infrastructure. We've been looking for ways to try and on a practical level, employ people, create, create jobs. So when we could do online streaming, we couldn't engage artists for a live performance, but we could engage them to do a closed door recording uh, that where we could control the environment a bit more in terms of hygiene and temperature checks and everything. And so that would allow us to, to you know, get their artwork out, give them performance opportunities and keep it going. So we've been just trying to, um, it's, it's been a creative problem solving period of time and, and to do it collectively. I mean, I think that's the most important thing at this time is not to everybody go off in a room and try and figure it out and then come back mm -hmm. with a solution. I think we can all agree. No one knows this is new territory. So let's, 
more brains are better than one and and if artists have good ideas we're open to it so we're it's been an ongoing conversation and just saying if you if you have thoughts please share <laughs> we're all yours and you know we're trying to figure it out too well i'm happy to have had your brain as part of this uh, allison of uh, uh these conversations are giving me and us a great perspective on what other people are thinking about and um it's not only meant to be helpful, but also just inspiring and informative. So I, I again, thank you for doing it. And is there anything else that you want to add or, uh, or uh, is this kind of where you are? I think uh, I'm so glad you're doing this because I think the opportunity to collectively envision a new future is so important. And it's an opportunity. This is a horrible experience for everybody. It's, it, it, but rather than have us hold our breath and wait for normal to come back to us, it's quite, that's quite a passive stance. We're in a position as arts leaders, as running these institutions, to create what the future is, to bring it in. And so I think that's our, our opportunity, but also our responsibility is, is not just to kind of wait for normal to come back because it ain't. <laughs> very, so very good point. Really good point. Uh, I've had about uh, four or five interviews so far, and some of them you might even recognize. So as we publish them, I hope you can get to them. Um, and we're looking forward to post yours. We'll let you know when. I'll let Alice know as well. Thank you again for making this happen. Really good to see you, and I'm I'm glad you're well uh, and, uh, and fighting your way through this. Uh, and great success forward for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johan. Nice to see you. Bye.